Hey, well, uh, how many of you were here last week? You were here last week? Last week? Okay. Um, uh, how many of you weren't here last week? You weren't here last week? Um, let's just go. We can go around, and we can just share maybe why you weren't here. We'll start with Kylie. <laughs> Um, hey, last week, we, uh, we, uh, Pastor Brandon preached an absolutely amazing, amazing message. And here's what I would say. If you weren't here, yeah, it, it was phenomenal. If you weren't here, get, get the podcast, download it on our app, save it, listen on your way to work. I mean, I think it really is a life message for me, a life message uh, for a lot of us in this room. And really, he, he asked the question, what is the church? And, and defined it really not as a, a place, but as a people. And so this morning, I want to kind of follow up. So what about those people who are in the church? What can we say about who we are? If church isn't a place, it's a people. Who are we? And so as I was thinking about this and about, you know, what does it mean to be a part of the church? What does it mean to follow Jesus? I was reminded of actually a story uh, that one of my professors from William Jessup uh, used to share. And he, uh, for a period of his life, was a church planter uh, in the Middle East. And so he lived in Lebanon, and one morning uh, he woke up, and he and his friend, and this is in the middle of the Iraq war, um, they decided, hey, we're going to drive into Iraq. How many of you, that's exactly what you would do if you were living in the Middle East? Like, let's wake up, let's go to Iraq. So he drives in uh, and gets to this this village, and and this village then swarms his car, surrounds him, and and is very, very angry because he's, you know, this this white Westerner that showed up in the middle of Iraq, in the middle of the Iraq war, and they're very angry with him, and he kind of talks them down. He's like, hey, I want to speak to your imam. Okay, and an imam is like the central Muslim teacher for for a village or for a town, kind of like a priest or a rabbi. Rabbi. So, um, so he, br- he goes before the imam, and the imam is same thing. Why, why have you come here? What are you doing? And, and my professor, this is what he actually says. He says, well, you know, I'm a, uh, I- I'm a follower of Jesus. And when I woke up this morning, I kind of felt like if Jesus was on the earth today, he would, uh, he would go to Iraq. So I follow him, so that's why I'm here. And the imam's like, excuse me? And, and my professor's like, yeah, well, Jesus spent a lot of his time with, with broken and hurting people. And right now, because of this war, you guys are really broken and hurting. And I mean, I follow Jesus. So if he would be here, then I need to be here. So that's why I'm here. And the imam's like, tell me more. And he gets to share with him parables, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus stops for somebody on the side of the parable of the prodigal son. The imam is so impressed with these stories that he tells that he invites my professor and his team to come back with a whole church planning team. They come back, set up a permanent base in this town in Iraq, and the imam protects them from the local government and says, you can't touch these people. They're real followers of Jesus. Like, so here's the question I want to ask this morning is, can we ever even be followers of Jesus like that? That's crazy. But here's the question I really want to ask is this, is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does that mean? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus um, comes and, he, and he's walking by the Sea of Galilee. And, he, and he's walking there, and it says he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Can I take a moment, before we really dive in, I just really feel there's, there's, there's a real presence of God that's in this room. How many of you felt the presence of God during worship? And again, it's not about feelings. God's presence isn't just a feeling. It's a fact. It's a reality. Um, I want to take a second just to pray for us before we really dive into Matthew 4. So why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's in the room. Lord, we thank you that you are here. And God, we just declare right now in the name and authority of Jesus that this is an anxiety-free zone. God, you are the prince of peace. Just with eyes closed, if you're saying, you know, I need Jesus to take some of my anxiety right now, just lift your hands. God, we give this to you. God, we give anxiety and stress to you. God, thank you that you are the prince of peace. Thank you for those who are in the middle of even family crises right now, specific family crises. God, we think that you can be the peace in the middle of the storm. 
And I also really feel like I want to pray for those of you in the room who need a breakthrough moment. You've been asking for a breakthrough moment. Just nice close, lift your hand if that's you. You're saying there's, a, there's an area in my life I need breakthrough in. God, we thank you that your breakthrough can come. Even this morning, Lord, we pray for financial provision for those in this room who are in financial need. God, thank you that you are the provider. It's who you are. You're not like, like, like an ATM, but you really actually care for us. You care for our needs. You care for, for people in this room. So thank you that you're the provider this morning in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Maybe some of us have kind of identified followers of Jesus with this word uh, Christian. Christian. Just pop quiz. How many of you have ever heard the word Christian before? You've heard of it? So hey, here's what some of us might be surprised about, though, especially those of us who've grown up in church. Um, the word Christian is actually only used in this book three times. It's actually only used three times, and uh, the kind of the most positive context um, that we get is in 1 Peter, uh, where Peter says, uh, says uh, you basically take comfort if you suffer as a Christian. Uh, and that's one of the contexts of Christian, is, is it's related to suffering, um, and that's kind of the only time in Scripture where somebody says, you know, hey, we are Christians, I am a Christian. The other two times this word used, it's actually used by people outside of these Jesus churches, uh, talking about the people inside the Jesus churches. And that's actually in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 11, it talks about in Antioch, which is kind of modern day Turkey, so really far north of Jerusalem, it says that the disciples were first called Christians. And then a little bit later in the book of Acts, uh, Agrippa, who's a Roman leader, says to Paul, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? So once again, it's not on the lips of the actual people in the Jesus churches, it's those outside. And so a lot of scholars have looked at this and kind of said, why isn't this word Christian being used? And they've kind of decided um, that, 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 that what makes the most sense is that in the Roman Empire, which has so many different religions in it, so many different groups that are springing up, and all of these different groups, and, and they're called mystery religions and different names like this, uh, would all name themselves according to the God that they worshipped. And so right around the 100s, 200, all of a sudden there's this new group springing up that's talking a lot about this, this God named Jesus Christ that they follow. And so the Romans named the Christians just like the other religions, according to their God, names them Christians. And then Christians eventually take that on and kind of say, okay, that we agree, like that's who we are. But I think there's, there's something in this. There's something in this where I think that that's actually a way a lot of us still think about Christianity today, especially maybe those of us in the room that aren't necessarily a part of a church or would say that they're a Christian, is this. Is Christianity one of many religions? And is that primarily what it means to be a Christian, to be a member of a religious group? And that's one way that maybe some of us think about this word Christian. And the second way is this. If you fast forward a couple hundred years, uh, you have this Roman emperor named Constantine. And this is kind of a legend. Maybe some of us know this, but there's this legend that Constantine's fighting in a battle, fighting in a war, and he says, God, if you're real, um, you know, I'm going to make my whole empire Christian. Give me a sign. And as he's fighting, he sees a shield in the sky that has a cross on it, and then he ends up winning the battle, and then he makes the Roman Empire a Christian Empire. At this point, Christians had become almost 50% of the Roman Empire, so they would have been very well known at this point. He makes the whole empire Christian, but then all of a sudden, it's like the Christi Christianity becomes sort of synonymous with the empire. And, and, and in order to become a Christian, you have to get baptized, and what would happen is sometimes the empire would take over new territories, and then people would be forced to become Christians by being baptized. And, and then later, in the name of Christianity, the Ottoman Empire goes and invades the Middle East with the holy wars, again, forcing people into their empire, which is also Christian. And so maybe that, I just want to suggest some of us maybe still have uh, sort of this sense of maybe that's what Christianity is. Maybe that's what it means to be a Christian. It's somehow tied to political power and politics and force and empire. And then a few years later, and I know I'm going through a lot of history very fast, but I just want us to understand kind of how did we get this word Christian? What's all kind of the baggage maybe it has? And, and in the Enlightenment time, there's all these philosophers that come with these new ideas of philosophies, and, and politicians follow the philosophers and take on their ideas. And there's this one uh, politician named Thomas Jefferson. Has anyone ever heard of Thomas Jefferson? 
So Thomas Jefferson, uh, I don't know if you know this, but he sits down one day um, at his desk. Maybe there's an oil lamp burning, and he actually takes a knife and takes the Bible, and he actually cuts out parts of the Bible that he doesn't like. So he cuts out all the miracle stories of Jesus. He cuts out all the times where Jesus kind of claims to be God and leaves kind of just his life and his moral teachings and publishes it. And it's now kind of a Thomas Jefferson Bible called The Life and Morals of Jesus Christ. Um, and you can actually buy it on Amazon for four ninety six paperback copy. If you want to read a Bible with no miracles in it, it's available to you. Um, but I think this actually represents then another way that some of us in this room think about Christianity, is it a philosophy or a belief system where we can pick and choose which parts of it we're going to agree with? Are we following this? So some of us maybe think about Christianity as just one of many religions. Some of us think about it as maybe it's a political system and an empire. Some of us maybe think about it as a philosophy or a belief system. Um, And then now, I think what we have, if you look around the world today with the rise of globalization, and now it's easier than it's ever been in history to cross the world, um, you find kind of these cultural differences. And I think the best way to illustrate this is when we were in China this summer, we were talking to these three sweet Chinese college girls, and we, had, we told them the gospel. We invited them to become followers of Jesus, and this is what they said to us. This is what they said, and this is a common story from missionaries in the East, is they said, oh, man, like, that's, that's so nice of you to ask, but, you know, we are a, you are American, and so, therefore, you are Christians, but we are Chinese, and, therefore, we are Buddhists, so we can't become American Christians, And that's actually a common story in the East where Christianity is synonymous with what it means to be a Westerner, with what it means to be an American. And maybe that's even how some of us in this room think about Christianity. Is it a culture of a country? So how do we think about Christianity? Is it a religion? Is it a a political system? Is it a philosophy, a belief system? Or is it just a product of culture? And here's what I want to suggest this morning is maybe it's some of those things, maybe it's none of those things, but what Christianity really is about is a person. It's not a political system, it's a person. It's about a person named Jesus. And, and we are, are, who follow Jesus, maybe our primary identity statement shouldn't be Christian. Maybe our primary identity statement should be a follower of Jesus. Um, does anyone want to guess what the, um, what the primary, I guess the slide's kind of been up there for a while. Just don't read it. Pretend like you haven't see it, seen it. Does anyone want to guess what the primary word for someone who follows Jesus in the New Testament is? It's disciples. Say Disciples. Come on, some of you, some of you cheated. So you can put it back up now. It's time. It's time. There's no, a scholar says, there's no New Testament evidence that the term Christian was commonly used as a self-designation by the early church. Luke, so the author of Acts, implies that the common term for believers at the time was disciples. And so, I mean, I think, I just think back to my story. Many of you have maybe have stories like this in the room. As I grew up in a, in a family that wasn't Christian, it wasn't a Christian family, and my grandma would sometimes take me to church, though, and I began to have some understanding of who God was. And then when I was in seventh grade, I went to a, uh, I went to a Christian camp. Has anyone ever been to, like, a summer camp or a winter camp before? And so I go to this camp, and this preacher uh, preaches about giving your life to Jesus. I remember it was Tuesday night. It was a week-long camp. Tuesday night, the preacher preaches about giving your life to Jesus. And I remember listening and kind of understanding just little, um, how old are you in seventh grade? Twelve? Are you twelve? Are you eleven? Like 12 or 11. So I was sitting there. How old? 12. Okay, great. So 12. I'm sitting there, 12 years old. And I remember thinking, like, this is serious. Like, this is a big deal, giving my life to Jesus. Like, I don't know if I'm ready to do this. And then I had a talk with my youth pastor. And he's like, hey, you should go read the book of John. And so I remember I read my, I found my journal from that night years later, and I wrote that I was, I was physically shaking. I was so shaken by what happened. And so I walked back to my, my room. All the other kids went, like, roller skating, and I went back to my room and started reading the Gospel of John. And I remember thinking, like, man, like, this is halfway through. Like, i got to start at the beginning. 
And so that summer, I mean, this is so intense when I think about it now, but like, I was like, I'm going to read the whole Bible. So that summer between seventh and eighth grade, I started in Genesis and I read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And every, every Sunday I wrote, I had a little three by five index card and I used to write all of my questions on this card um, and go to my youth pastor. And these were a lot of questions. Like I'm reading Leviticus. Like if you haven't read it, it's intense. And so... So I'm going to him. Eventually, he, he put a limit on me. I could only ask three questions on a Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually it comes to be November. So I've been reading the books of the Bible. It comes to be November. And, and my church is doing a membership course to become a member of the church. And so I go to the membership course, and we have to go around and share when we decided to become Christians, to give our lives to Jesus. And it gets to me, and I'm like, well, I've never really done that before, but like, I, but by this time, I'd been reading the Bible so much. I'd been praying. I'd been worshiping. I, I, I never had a moment where I, like, decided I was a Christian now because I, I met a person. Like, I met Jesus. And I remember being in seventh grade trying to, like, explain that. Like, well, I've never, like, prayed a prayer before, but, like, I know Jesus. Like, I know him. I'm, I, I'm his friend. And so, we, so we, they kind of pray with me, pray, pray kind of like an official prayer. And then it's like, I'm a follower of Jesus right now. But, but my, my story really was I didn't encounter a belief system. I didn't encounter a philosophy or religion. I met a person, and his name is Jesus. And that was my decision to become a follower of him. And so we have to ask, is that Siri about Jesus? Come on, Siri, preach the gospel. Okay. Um, So my decision was like, I'm going to follow this person, Jesus. And so when we look at scripture, what does Jesus invite his disciples into? In Matthew chapter 4, it says he's walking by the Sea of Galilee. So we can just imagine, I mean, it's sunny. There's birds flying overhead, blue skies, walking on the sand. And kind of, how many of you guys know like that salty smell that's by the beach, that salty smell? So it's like, you know, it's the Sea of Galilee. It's a salt sea, so there's salt in the air. And who knows how many boats of fishermen there are? There's probably, I mean, so many boats. And, and fishermen fishing. I don't know how Jesus actually walked up uh, to Peter and Andrew. Maybe he walks up to their boat and it's by the shore. I don't know if he like rows his own boat out next to them or calls to them from the shore, but somehow he says to them, uh, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they leave their nets and follow him. And from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. There's something about Jesus that causes these guys to leave their jobs and their family to follow him. They don't know, guys realize this, like they don't know anything about him. He just shows up and there's something about the person of Jesus that causes them to leave everything and say, I'm going to give my whole life. Here I am. There's something about Jesus. And so I think it would be fun. I mean, we could even like play a game. Like what things, things that Jesus didn't say to get his disciples to follow. So he doesn't go up to them and say, hey, I have an amazing class on discipleship that I would love for you to sign up for. It's Tuesday nights. The workbook's $10. (laughs) Things Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, hey, my church, my synagogue is having an amazing conference next month. Hillsong is going to be there. (laughs) Would you like to come? He didn't say, hey, you know, I really want to invest in you. I want to disciple you. Um, let's set up some coffee times in the next couple months. Let's meet on Tuesdays at 3. I'm a little bit busy, though. Let's do every other week, Tuesdays at 3. You're going to get discipled. He didn't say any of those things that we might imagine discipleship to be. He says, follow me. Because here's the reality. Discipleship is not a program. It's a process of learning how to follow Jesus. Discipleship is not a program. It's a process. And it's about the person of Jesus becoming like him. So can I give you, can I give us maybe, as we talk about, we want to be a church that disciples leaders that transform culture. And we talk about discipleship. We're not talking about we're going to have some great classes. We're going to have some great programs, some great events. We're talking about how we're going to raise up some people that look like Jesus and are going to go shake the earth because they look so much like Jesus does. So can I give us a definition of discipleship that we can work from? Is that okay? So here here would be what I would say discipleship is. 
it's adapted a little bit from Mike Breen, um, but it says this, a disciple is one who imitates Jesus' words, ways, and works and teaches others to do the same. A disciple is somebody who imitates Jesus' words, ways, and works and teaches others to do the same. Do you want me to get in your picture there? Okay. And so here's a question for us. Is, are we people that imitate Jesus' words, ways, and works? Am I a person that imitates that? And am I teaching someone else to do it too? And the word disciple in the Bible, it's really, really closely tied uh, to the word follow. And I just want to say actually one more thing about this is, is really, I think culture right now is experiencing the effects of Christianity as one religion of many, of Christianity as a political power, of Christianity as a belief system, of Christianity as a culture. Culture needs now more than ever people who are saying, hey, Christianity isn't those things. Christianity is about following Jesus. Christianity is about being a disciple that looks like Jesus. Here's what's going to win culture is not trumping their belief systems and trumping their culture with the better one. It's going to be people who look, act, and think like Jesus. And here's our call as a church is not to be church attenders. It's to be disciples. I would even say, and this might be controversial, not even to be Christians, but to be disciples in the full sense of the word, someone who follows Jesus. And so really, discipleship in the Bible is really, really close to the word follow. And and you even see that in Matthew chapter 4. He says, follow me, and it's the idea of discipleship. And so we're people who are following Jesus where he goes. And that's why I love that story of my professor at the beginning, because it's this tangible picture of like following Jesus somewhere. So here's what I want to ask is where are we following him? Where are we following him? Where is he going? Just turn to your neighbor and say, where's Jesus going? Where's he going? So here's what we see. Here's what we see in Matthew. Here's what we see in Matthew. One of the first stories we have, one of the first stories we have is he calls his disciples, but right before that, he has this moment, Jesus, where he gets baptized. We have a moment where Jesus gets baptized, and he's there, and the Spirit of God descends on him, and a voice from heaven speaks, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And what I love about this story is that this happens, the voice of God speaks, defines Jesus' identity before he's done anything. So he hasn't healed the sick. He hasn't raised the dead. He hasn't done any of this stuff. He hasn't taught. Yet God says, without any of these actions and successes still, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. As if to say who we are is not based on our circumstances, but based on what God says about us. Who we are is not based on our successes or failures. Who we are is based on what God says about us. And then one of the first things Jesus does, he calls his disciples, and then he preaches basically a three-chapter-long sermon, the longest sermon we have recorded of Jesus in the Bible called, maybe some of you know it, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's all about defining these disciples, not according to the kingdom of Caesar, but according to the kingdom of God. And he says things like, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, almost as if he's trying to redefine their identity from not based on circumstances, but based on what he's saying. And so my life, this looked like I got saved in eighth grade. I decided to follow Jesus, and, and I got saved in a, in a Presbyterian church. Has anyone ever been to a Presbyterian church before? I love, come on, a lot of us. I love Presbyterians because Presbyterians love the Word of God. They love the Word of God. And so I got used to, in kind of my formative years of learning how to follow Jesus, listening to like hour and a half long sermons, like three times a week. I remember being in eighth grade, listening to a sermon where they just did a diagram of the temple in Jerusalem. And that was like the sermon. And I was in eighth grade being like, I love this. I love the temple. And... Um, and then I remember, like, I had, I had a, um, I had a, I got a job at my grandpa's, uh, like, office. He, he, and, and I had to, do, like, make boxes and seal envelopes. I mean, just sealing envelopes for hours. So I was a freshman. And, and I'd heard about this guy named Francis Chan. Has anyone ever heard of Francis Chan? And so, and so I'd heard that he's, like, really passionate about Jesus. And I love Jesus. And I love teaching. And so I, I downloaded 
all of his podcasts. And I, and I, and I, I think I listened to that summer to about 150 Francis Chan sermons, just listening to the words of God. But what was happening is God was, by listening to his words, God was realigning my identity from the things and my circumstances and past, and he was realigning it with what God said about him. And kind of the climax moment is at one point in high school, I was just so beaten down. Many of us, just this happens. How many of you, well, I won't have you raise your hands, but we get what this means. It's like the voice of depression gets so loud in our lives. The voice of anxiety gets so loud in our lives. The voice of our past gets so loud in our lives. Financial pressures get so loud that we begin to believe things about ourselves based on those things rather than based on what God says about us. And so I remember kind of a climactic moment in high school as I was like, there's so many things I was struggling. I was like, am I even like a son? Like, what does it mean? Am I good enough? Am I liked by people? Do people even like me? And I remember sitting in my room and I wrote a list of all these kind of things that my circumstances were telling me. Like, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough of a man. I'm not liked by people, all these things. And then I found the truth in this book and the things that Jesus said. And I write it, wrote it right next to it. And I remember crying and just crossing out those lies, saying, you know, I'm not going to be defined by the voice of depression and anxiety. I'm, I'm defined by the voice of my dad. It was a climactic moment in my life. And here's what I think is God's inviting some of us in the room to be a disciple of Jesus by listening to his words. And so where are we following? Number one, we're going to follow Jesus into authentic identity by listening to his words. And for some of us, that's going to mean silencing those other voices and listening to this voice. We want to be a people defined by his words. And so I don't know what that looks like. For, and, and I think it looks like, I just want to suggest, I think it looks like more than just listening to the word on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And that's part of discipleship is it looks like listening to Jesus's words on the drive to work Monday morning. And can, can I tell you what I do? Can I just tell you practically what I do? I mean, because I, I mean, Maybe there's some people in here that just have an overabundance of time to wake up in the morning, make their coffee, tea, sit down, read scripture for three hours. That's awesome if that's you. That's amazing. For those of us who like have jobs and responsibilities, I mean, here's what I do. I mean, I just listen to the audio Bible on my way to work in the morning, on my way to teaching. I, I listen to the audio Bible, and it's such a valuable time. Sometimes I'm like wiping the sleepies out of my eyes, but I'm listening to scripture because those other voices can get so loud sometimes. But I'm a disciple of Jesus, which means my life is not oriented around what culture is saying. My life's oriented around what his story is saying. So what's it going to look like for us to be disciples, who get our identity from his words, who listen to his words, prioritize reading scripture? And so Jesus teaches them the Sermon on the Mount, and then uh, right after it's over, he kind of takes his disciples in Matthew chapter 8, or maybe it's 9, um, he talks about how they go to Peter's mom's house. He had Matthew 8, verse 14, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. And, and actually, in all the Gospels, it records some, sometime after Jesus picks his disciples, they go hang out at Peter's house. And so I just picture this. I picture like Jesus and a bunch of 20-something-year-old guys hanging out at Peter's mom's house. Like, I don't know if Peter's mom, you know, because she gets healed after this. She doesn't, doesn't have a fever. For her. I don't know if she like cooks a meal for them. Like, I almost imagine, like, I do, I, I mean, I'm a youth pastor, so I like to, like, hang out with young high school age guys, and I mean, it's fun. It's like we hang out, and, like, we cook stuff, and I remember being in high school, like, we did, this is ridiculous. This was totally crazy, but we, um, I would never do this today, but we made, like, a bacon weave. Has anyone ever had a bacon weave before, where you, like, weave bacon into strips, and then you weave it like this, and then we kind of cooked it and ate it and um, got really, really sick after <laughs> There was one high school, I shouldn't tell this story. There was one high school guy on Friday night, we were playing laser tag, and there was leftover soda from the last party. And I tried to stop him, I promise. But he took the whole gallon of soda and drank it and felt too sick to play the next game of laser tag. So I promise, we prayed for him. I did not mean for that to happen. If you send your kids to us, I, I will not make them drink a gallon of soda. It was a total accident. But it's kind of this... I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but it's like this fun app. I was trying to give you a picture because there was something in high school that was awesome when you're hanging out with your guys and then it's like your friend's mom makes dinner for you and it's like this best thing. It like builds community. And so it's this picture of a bunch of guys, obviously a little older than high school, but they're hanging out in a house, having these community types of experiences, eating dinner around the dinner table. 
Does that make sense? And so Jesus isn't like doing discipleship just on a Sunday morning and having people come and listening to his synagogue teaching. He's doing this thing in the space of life, in homes over dinner. And so I remember for me, I got, I got saved in this Presbyterian church. And then uh, a few years later, I heard about this church called The Rock. And so I decided, um, I'd heard that they were charismatic. And so I was like, I like to worship, like I'll come. And, uh, and so I come, I come to The Rock. And I mean, at that point in time, there was this one person up front on Friday night that was lifting his hands and, and worshiping. And I was like, man, this church loves Jesus so much. Like, I've never seen that before. That's amazing. Um, and so I decided to come. I mean, Presbyterians, I love Presbyterians. I was a Presbyterian. They're, frame, they're famous, kind of the phrase people used to describe them as the, uh, the frozen chosen. And so they love the word. They love the word. I learned so much about the word. Um, but then this guy's up here worshiping. And so I decided, man, I, I'm going I'm to be a part of this. Like, this is fun. And then uh, what begins to happen is, is the youth pastor at that time, uh, Pastor Brandon. Has anyone ever seen Pastor Brandon up here before? So... Pastor Brandon kind of begins to invite me into the space of his life. And all of a sudden, I find myself not just having experiences with God in the church building, um, but he would be like, hey, I have to go to Costco. Do you want to come with me? And uh, we'd fill up our car for, like, outreach and stuff. We'd fill up our car with, like, toilet paper and paper towels. It had a big Nissan Pathfinder that we used to just fill with coupon stuff. But, I mean, my Christianity looked like learning how to follow Jesus. My high school years looked like me sharing about my problems in the aisle of Costco, crying, and then having a spiritual dad who'd actually invited me into the space of his life to help minister to me. And that's what it looks like to follow Jesus is learning. And this is number two. Where is Jesus going? Well, he's going into radical community. And we want to follow Jesus into radical community by copying his ways. And the way he does things is not just in the church building, but in the space of life in homes, in Costco. Here's why we have to kind of have a transformation of our thinking of discipleship doesn't just look like Sunday mornings. The kingdom of God can happen anywhere. The kingdom of God can break in in Costco. The kingdom of God can break in in our living rooms. But here's what it's going to require of us is we've gotten really used to our homes being kind of like these private spaces for just us, where it's like our self-protection and our rest. And uh, one thing I love, Christine Pohl says this. She says, you know that quote from Christine Pohl, historically, homes have been a central location for hospitality, but in this society, we view our homes as very private space. And then the next slide, this is what she goes on to say, homes can become small outposts of the kingdom of God. And we have to kind of sacrifice this because historically, she says, homes were these social spaces because people used to live in community. Like, do we realize people used to live with aunts, with uncles, with grandma, with great grandpa, and all of these people used to live together. And homes used to be these social spaces where family happened until the 1920s and the invention of the automobile. Does anyone have an automobile? You've driven one before. Maybe you've seen them. They're on the street. Wheels go. Um, and so the, the automobile gets invented, and all of a sudden, sons and daughters can grow up and move out of their parents' house and drive away. And then the airplane happens. Sons and daughters can grow up and move away from their parents and, and move away from their grandparents. And then um, all of a sudden, there's this creation of something called the nuclear family of a mom and a dad and kids and homes, instead of being the social space where community can happen, become this private space where we protect our families from the world. What if the way Jesus did ministry is actually to recapture our homes as social spaces where the kingdom of God can happen? I, I love this story. There's a family that we love um, that lives up in Washington, and they tell stories about they have, they have a strong mom and dad, a strong family, and they, their kids bring their friends over, and they have stories of their friends just walking in the door and crying because they've never seen the love of a real dad like that before. There's something, there's healing, I'm convinced that there's healing that can happen at a dinner table that can never happen in a church building. 
Because there's something about, and if I could tell you, this is the story of a lot of uh, young people, a lot of millennials, a lot of 30 and under, is they didn't necessarily always develop what's called psychologically secure attachments with their parent figures, which means feeling safe and feeling comfortable. And so when they get saved, they're looking for moms and dads in the church to become their secure attachments, to be safe relationships. And so are we going to be those people that open our doors or the people that close our doors? Are we going to be the people that say, hey, we're going to have an open dinner table? Or are we going to people, be people saying, hey, this is our, this is our, our private time? Because I'm telling you, I was, that, I was that millennial that got saved. And when I came to church, I was so hungry to see what a family that loved Jesus looked like. I just remember being like 17, looking at older families in the church. And this cry of my heart was like, invite me over for dinner. Like, I want to see what it looks like to love Jesus, not just at the altar, but on Sunday and Monday. What does it look like? We have to be the church who becomes spiritual moms and dads, who does radical community in the ways of Jesus. So Jesus takes his disciples, they hang out in homes, they're eating dinner, Peter's mom's cooking for them, and then they go, and they go, and Jesus gives them a commission in Matthew 10, and he says, um, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness, these 12 Jesus sent out. So the last way we follow Jesus is we follow Jesus into his kingdom mission by doing his works. We follow Jesus into his kingdom mission by doing his works. And this is another way we imitate Jesus is Jesus spends time healing the sick, raising the dead, and then he sends them out to do exactly what he did, heal the sick and raise the dead. So I remember... After that time, when I uh, gave my life to Jesus at the membership class, I went home, I told my family, I was super excited. And then I, I go and, and I go back to my room and because I'd read so much of this book at that point, I remember, I remember thinking this, like, man, I laid on my bed and I said, I, since I gave my life to Jesus, that means I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's all I thought. And I was laying on my bed and all of a sudden, it was like waves of joy were coursing through my body. Like joy unexplainable. Like I couldn't even explain it. It it wasn't based on my circumstances. It was based on God. And I couldn't move for like 30 minutes, this unexplainable joy. And then later I came to the rock and I go to a winter camp in 2010 and the same thing happens. I get hit with this unexplainable joy. And right after the joy happens, the speaker gets up and says, hey, we're going to pray for healing. And so he starts praying for healing. For the first time in my life, I mean, I'm seeing crazy things. I'm seeing people who couldn't move their back do backflips. I remember seeing this girl who needed glasses break her glasses because she just didn't need them anymore. God supernaturally healed her eyesight. And all of a sudden, I began to learn, man, like being filled with the Holy Spirit means we get to do Jesus' works and see his kingdom come to earth. And that's kind of the theology of healing. The theology of works is like in heaven, there's no sickness. And so when Jesus told us to pray on earth as it is in heaven, we get to participate in that kingdom mission by making it on earth as it is in heaven. So this is what discipleship looks like. I want to invite Tracy to come up to the keys, and we're going to pray here um, whenever whenever Tracy gets here because we need the, the music so we can feel spiritual. Let's give it a minute here. Man, how many of you God's speaking to you right now? God's speaking something to you. This is, this is what discipleship looks like. We've got to imitate Jesus' words, ways, and works. And I want to throw up, can we put up that verse from Matthew 4 one more time? I'm going to throw up that verse from Matthew 4. I'm going to show you the beginning and the end of the story of Matthew. In the beginning of the story of Matthew, we have Matthew chapter 4. He says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. So do we catch this? Right at the beginning, Jesus says, follow me. And then there's others who are going to come after you. From day one, he didn't say, follow me, and then kind of get settled a little bit, learn some stuff, and then you're going to make disciples. Do you guys realize this? The call to have people come after them was actually there on day one. How many of us, when we responded to Jesus, we responded, yes, I'm going to be a disciple and I'm going to make disciples. Maybe, I don't know how many of us, that was our experience. Maybe some of us just said, yeah, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to believe in Jesus. But Jesus invited disciples who were then going to make disciples. And so we have to realize if we've said yes to following Jesus, it requires that last part of the definition I gave, which is 
and teaches others to do the same. And so then Jesus invites these disciples into his experiences. He teaches them who they are with his words. He shows them how to live with his ways, and he does works. And then at the end of the story, this is how he ends it in Matthew 28. He, he comes, and this is probably one of the last verses we have in Matthew 28. He comes, the 11 disciples go to Galilee, the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. And guess what? They didn't have all the church lingo that we have, all the Christianese that we've learned. All they would have known is, man, this guy took us into his life, started teaching us his words. This guy took us into his life, started hanging out with us at our houses. He did community with us. And this guy did some crazy works and we got discipled and now he's asking us to do the same thing. Wouldn't their only option have been to teach people how to do the same? I think there's a call on us to kind of let go of maybe some of the things we've thought discipleship to be and say yes to we're going to be a church that imitates Jesus' words, ways, works and teaches others to do the same. So let's stand together. I want to respond to this. I want to respond to this word. I heard about a church in Asia um, that we're, we're connected to with, uh, with, 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 with Inuit Global, that, which is how we partner in China, but this church is in the Philippines where um, the, if you walk into the church, it's a church of 120,000. I mean, it's crazy big. They have tons of different locations all over. But if you walk into this church, you can ask anyone in the room. Um, you can say, hey, who is discipling you? And who are you being discipled by? And they can answer it. What if that's what we looked like as a church where any one of us knows immediately who's investing in us, who's committed to be a spiritual mom and dad to us and who we're investing in? What's it gonna look like for us as a church to restore generations that didn't get secure attachments with parent figures and be spiritual moms and dads? Even if you're 20 years old, committing to invest in somebody who's younger than you. Even if you're 17, committing to invest in somebody that's younger than you. I tell you, I think this is the dream on God's heart is great grandparents in a church discipling grandparents who disciple parents, who disciple kids, who disciple 13-year-olds, who disciple the 10-year-olds, who disciple 12-year-olds. And maybe that's what Jesus had in mind when he said, go make disciples of all nations. He didn't say become Christians and do church really, really well. He said, make disciples. So let's close our eyes. Let's close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for what you might be speaking to those of us in the room. Here's what I want to ask. I just feel like God is really present in this moment. And and I just want to take a moment to respond to him and ask this question. Which one of those three things is Jesus highlighting to you? Words, which is related to authentic identity, Maybe he's highlighting his ways to you uh, related to community, or maybe he's highlighting his works to you related to kingdom mission. Which one of those things is Jesus highlighting to you this morning? Words, ways, or works? Yeah, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Words, ways, or works? And then I just want to ask the question, what is God saying to you about it? And then the last question I want to ask is this, is how can I practically live this out this week? What does it practically look like? We want to be a group of people that imitate Jesus' words, imitate his ways, imitate his works. So for some of us in the words category, maybe it looks like, hey, I'm going to commit to listen to my audio Bible on the drive tomorrow morning. Maybe it's going to look like, hey, I'm going to find some time when I lay down in bed to open up a psalm and read it. I'm going to find the time to listen to sermons to, to on the drive, on my runs, on my workouts. What is it going to look like for us practically to prioritize God's word as a people? I just want to see, just with eyes closed, how many of you was it words that Jesus highlighted to you? Just lift your hands words. So what's that going to look like for you? And then the second one is this, his ways, 
his ways? What is it going to look like for us to be a people that practice radical community? Is there, is there someone you need to invite over to dinner tomorrow night? Is there someone younger than you in your life that you need to have a raw conversation with and say, hey, I want to invest in you. I want to be here for you. I want to fight for you. Is there a person you need to even maybe repent for not being there like you should have? I just want to say one more thing on that. You know, uh, we're as young people, we're not looking for perfect examples. We're looking for real examples. And one of the biggest enemies to discipleship is this lie of perfection. You know, we have to wait to be perfect. If you're waiting to be perfect, you'll never disciple. It's just good enough, really. We're not looking for, for perfect. We're looking for real. So who's a person that you can invite into your life, that you can invite over for dinner tomorrow? I just want to see, uh, again, with just close your eyes. How many of you was it the ways related to community that Jesus highlighted you? Yeah, there's tons of hands all over the room. Thank you, Lord, for speaking. And lastly is works. What is it going to look like to imitate the works of Jesus? Maybe there's some of you that need a miracle in your body or a miracle in your family. And Jesus is inviting you to pray for that again and commit. Maybe Fridays. Pray for it Fridays. I don't know. What is it practically going to look like? Being ready at Starbucks to pray for the people in line before us and behind us. What does it look like to do his works? So here we go. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite just the prayer team to come up. And we're just going to respond to God in prayer. And we'll close. And you can come up and receive more prayer if you want. So just, just whatever it is, just with your eyes closed, just kind of symbolically, if you want to hold your hands out, um, just say, God, I, I want you to help me to hear your words. God, I want you to help me live your ways. God, I want you to help me to do your works. God, uh, culture is looking for not more Christians. Culture is looking for people that look, act, and think like Jesus. So help us to be your disciples. God, help us to follow you. Lord, I ask um, for those in the room who need to hear your word like truth, where the voice of the enemy has been so loud, speaking lies. You know what? Just with eyes closed, if you're saying the voice of the enemy has been so loud. I've heard the lies and I need God to break through with this truth. Just lift your hands if that's you. Just lift your hands. God, we pray for breakthrough right now in the name and authority of Jesus. God, we silence the lies of the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of suicide, the spirit of depression. Lord, we pray for a breakthrough of your truth this morning. God, you are reality. Wash us with your words, God. Wash us with your words and help us to live this out, to be your disciples, just even under your breath, just say, Jesus, I want to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.